All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here with Paul and Josh um, to help us uh, answer some of the questions. I'm really pleased to tell you that I've also got two of our frontline mayors. I've got Mark Bouton, the mayor of uh, Danbury, and Harry Rilling, the mayor of Norwalk. I asked them both to come because they were on the front lines early. The very first infection, I was there with uh, Mark Bouton at Danbury Hospital about uh, six weeks ago now. Somebody from New York had crossed the border and was up there working and got infected. And uh, they're both going to give us, uh, in a few minutes, their story about what they learned by being first in the state in terms of how, the, how to deal with the COVID crisis. As we think about the rest of the state and ways we should go forward, I think their example will be very um, interesting. With that, I'll just give you um, briefly um, the summary. A couple of things here are interesting. Um, sadly, another 69 members of our Connecticut family are no longer with us. And um, these are not numbers. These are um, uh, friends and family uh, of our here in Connecticut. And I feel that every day. Um, in terms of hospitalizations, um, the number is 19. And before we say, oh, right, that's great, that number continues to go down, I'll explain that a little more in a minute. And tests performed, um, which is a key number because we're always talking about ramping up our testing, it's probably worth um, remembering that that number is down and it's not going up as fast as we want to, again, because uh, we're short of those sample kits. And uh, that's what we need. Um, we're ready to ramp up our testing in a significant way. We just got to make sure we can get those sample kits in place. The hospitalizations by county, um, I think the two things that you can maybe see in that little line is that Fairfield was flattening out a few days ago, is now ramping up a little bit, and I'm afraid that's because of a spike in Bridgeport that we talked about uh, recently. New Haven has gone down a little bit, and uh, that was the county that was growing the fastest until recently. But, um, you know, there are some indications that hospitalizations are still fluctuating, so we'll watch that number carefully. And uh, Hartford continues to go up consistently, and fortunately the rest of the state is still um, relatively untouched, which means it gives us an opportunity to make sure the infection does not hit there as hard. I'd like to spend a little more time talking about hospitalizations and discharges. Because this is the number. I usually give you the net number on hospitalizations, and, and you say it's going up, it's going down, and that's good. Well, you can see on this chart just over the last, uh, you know, five days that hospitalization number of admissions, you can see, have been going down for a few days. And uh, that was, uh, that's an indication that perhaps the infection rate was receding a little bit, um, and hospitalization is the best way to gauge that. It popped up a little bit on April 13th. And um, the only reason you see only 19 net increase is because the discharges went up a lot as well. But we have to keep an eye on that admissions uh, chart because that does uh, reflect the nature of the uh, pandemic and how it's uh, maybe uh, continuing to expand in its own way. I will say that uh, the discharges, though, also reflect the fact that this pandemic has been with us for three, four, five weeks. A number of people have spent time in their hospital beds. Um, are now going into intermediate care home to recover. So that means we do have expanding capacity in our hospitals with only 19 new hospitalizations. That is something we're able to manage and manage well for the foreseeable future, uh, subject to us getting the necessary PPE. It's also interesting that we just had a meeting with um, a virtual meeting uh, with the Unified Command. Again, all the commissioners, the key department uh, leaders there and again, we were worried about firefighters and social workers and others who are testing positive had to quarantine themselves for um, 14 days, what that was doing to our um, folks on the front lines. And they are just like you see with the um, hospitalizations, while uh, we still have a, a rising number of our frontline um, state employees who are getting infected, we also have more people being discharged. So just like with the hospitalizations, I hope that's stabilizing. We'll have the uh, people there to take care of you, whether um, it's, you know, remember, firefighters do most of the EMT work, so uh, incredibly important. Uh, mental health workers, nurses, they are coming back into uh, the game. Um, daycare, it was interesting from Beth Bai, we're talking about how our state's doing compared to other states in terms of capacity. 
Most other states, uh, the average, they lost about 60% of their daycare centers. Uh, you know, we urge as many daycare centers to stay open. We did a little bit better than that. A fewer shut down, and more importantly, we were able to open up daycare centers next to our different hospitals, uh, thanks to uh, Dalio Philanthropies. So that means we have more daycare capacity, which puts us in a little better position. I think we're also in a better position compared to our peers when it comes to financial capacity. Uh, in part, I've talked about before that uh, we've had more of a cash reserve than uh, most of our neighboring states, in part thanks to um, uh, a robust rainy day fund. So that gave us a little bit more um, room to maneuver. That allowed us to uh, defer um, sales tax and income tax and corporate income tax. Normally, tomorrow would be tax day, but now that's deferred a few months, and I hope that makes a difference. That's part of what our cash cushion allowed us to do. But we do need it. Um, Melissa McCaw, our commissioner, OPM, um, pointed out that we probably have about $450 million right now in uh, COVID-related expenses. A lot of that's related to health care and co-pays and expanded Medicaid and overtime. So uh, while a lot of other states are in an incredibly tough cash squeeze, um, Connecticut right now is, uh, is, is doing better. Uh, but don't get any false sense of confidence. Um, when you have a, an unemployment rate like we do, um, even our cash cushion uh, is gonna get squeezed. I feel pretty confident I feel confident that we're going to have enough cash to get through this fiscal year, and then we'll have enough of the rainy day fund to turn the corner for uh, the next fiscal year after uh, July uh, 1st. Um, in the meantime, we've had a little flexibility in some of our funds. I, I call it the Lehman Fund, the David Lehman Fund. That's the short-term bridge fund that we did for our small businesses. <clears throat> and there it's interesting. I mean, we did about $50 million for our small businesses, which is thousands of small business loans, allowing you a bridge until we get the uh, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Money from the feds. And, uh, you know, we did 50 million. Um, Massachusetts did 20 million. New York uh, did 10 million. So we had a little bit more wherewithal to take care of our small businesses going forward as well. Uh, and, but that's so important. And uh, right now, if you look at our unemployment claims, you know, it's probably 15% of our workforce right now. Could be moving towards 20%. And uh, that gives you an idea of what a stretch that's gonna be for our state if this can continues for another six, nine, 12 months. Um, a shout out to Kurt Westby again. He's um, over there at Department of Labor. He has now processed over half of the um, uh, unemployment claims. He feels pretty confident that we'll get the rest of those uh, processed, uh, mainly direct deposit. If you have that, you'll get your money a lot faster within the next 10 days or so. Um, my apologies, though, for those folks who are self-employed, the so-called gig economy, um, that's a brand new program. So th that those people will take a little bit longer still. Uh, but as I've said before, at least the money is retroactive. Um, by the way, the federal government has sent out the $1,200 checks, and that starts uh, arriving um, tomorrow. Um, so I think that's some relatively good news there. I'm thinking about dates a little bit, because we talked about um, our plan to get this state um, back to work as soon as we can. Uh, as you know, um, uh, President Trump has put out the date of May 1, which I think most of the governors think is a very premature. I just showed you that hospitalizations are going up and infections are going up, and this is no time to take our eye off the ball. Uh, I put out a date of May 20th as our next decision node. That's uh, a little more than a month away. I said we're not gonna be reopening schools before May 20th, but by May 20th, we're gonna have a lot of our testing in place by then. We'll have a lot more of the PPE, the protective gear, and that will give us a lot stronger indication about uh, who and when and how people can start getting the work. Uh, obviously, we're, um, we're hustling to get those masks right now, and that's gonna be focused on healthcare workers now, but then it's gonna be uh, retail and food service and others so that we can begin to get back to work. And that brings me to um, the Connecticut Manufacturing Retool. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary the number of companies that have come forward and are redoing their manufacturing capacity, 
focused on the COVID crisis, doing everything they can to help us get the materials we need so we don't have to sit there with a tin cup waiting for the strategic reserve down in Washington, D.C. to get us the gear we need. I told you we're going to be able to sanitize about 90,000 masks a day, you know, in a week or so. But in the meantime, um, CT covidresponse.org is a place that manufacturing can go. We can get you some funding to help you retool. We've got um, Modern Plastics and Shelton and Webco Plastics and Middlefield and Curtis Packaging and Sandy Hook and Enhanced Color doing face shields. And that will be additional protection for our frontline healthcare workers and then more beyond that. Surgical masks, you know how desperately we need surgical masks. Uh, Josh will tell you we've got big orders scheduled for delivery. They were scheduled for yesterday, today, tomorrow. They will be coming. That's so key to us getting our people back to work, and that's part of the timing. But that said, we have a lot of smaller shops that are beginning to make this, uh, these masks, you know, and I just thank them. Top Deck out of uh, North Haven, Gilman Gear out of Gilman, and uh, Incord out of Colchester. These are the folks that are already there. We're able already to buy hand sanitizer. I, I told you about um, you know, some of the local shops that have done it. Um, Powder Hollow Brewer in Enfield. We're already buying 200 cases of sanitizer there. So Connecticut is standing up on its own two feet. Uh, commercial sewing in Torrington is getting going now on surgical gowns. So we're going to be better equipped to know what we have to do. And I got to tell you that um, UConn is right there to test each and every one of these um, new pieces of PPE coming from our homegrown and to make sure they're safe and responsible. We know how best to use them. But these are some of the variables that determine our May 20th date and uh, what we can do on May 20th and what will take a little bit longer. Uh, the last date I think about a lot, and I think about this with uh, Melissa McCaw at OPM, is uh, July 1st. Because you know that a lot of our bridge loans, a lot of the uh, loan forgiveness programs, a lot of the um, health care extensions and grace periods, uh, a lot of what's coming out of the federal government takes us through till July 1st. And that is a key date to either get that unemployment rate way down and our economy moving again, or the federal government's going to have to step up a big, big time. So those are the dates I have in my uh, head as I think about where we um, go over the next uh, month and two months. Uh, with that, I just want to, you know, introduce um, two mayors I've gotten to know really well and I, and I think the world of. Um, and I want them to also talk about what they got right, what they got wrong in uh, Danbury and in uh, Norwalk. And I'm thinking all the time about uh, we see the expanse of the COVID fever and I also worry about spring fever, that we take our eye off the ball and um, don't take it as seriously for the next month as we have for the uh, last month. With that, I'd like to introduce um, uh, my friend Mark Bowton, who's been on the front lines in Danbury for a long time. Mark? Well, thank you, Governor, and um, we just appreciate all the hard work that you've been doing on uh, this issue for us. You know, Danbury announced its first positive about six weeks ago on Friday, and you were right there at our side as we went through that process. So on behalf of this community, I want to thank you. Look, um, this is uh, uncharted territory for any mayor, any first selectman. I think I can speak for Mayor Rilling when I say that we both know way more about COVID virus than we ever would want to know ever. Uh, but having said all that, uh, it's been remarkable to watch local government uh, move forward and address a difficult issue. And it shows that government works. It works on the local level and it works on the state level. And certainly the state of Connecticut has been our strategic partner, uh, as well as all of our partners here in Danbury. We work closely with Danbury Hospital, with our school system, with Western Connecticut State University. We've been able to put together a, a first in class homeless shelter uh, in one of our hotels that's currently occupied by some of our residents who are, are most challenged among us. These things are, are real markers that we put down uh, so that we can follow that path. God forbid we should ever have to go through this in the future. Having said that, there's always things you wish you had done or wish you had known. Uh, certainly, uh, I don't think anybody anticipated uh, how contagious this virus really is. That really will make decisions for us as we go forward in terms of what the impact is on our nursing homes and, of course, our elderly residents throughout the city. 
So those are areas that we can always continue to work on, particularly our, our nursing homes and our elderly care facilities. But in general, uh, I am so proud to be leading this community, to be working with you, be working with other mayors like Mayor Rilling, uh, and out there every day trying to make this a little bit better for people as we go through these mitigation steps. And the last thing I'll say is that we can't quit. We've got to put our foot down. We've got to put the pedal to the metal. We want to open. We have to open and we have to do it safely. And that's the most important thing as we look forward together. We cannot backslide and I don't think anybody wants to go through this mitigation process again. Thank you, Mark. Let, let me ask one question before we introduce uh, Mayor Rilling. You're, you're a border town, border city, what? right next to New York. I mean, I'm trying to work um, with uh, Cuomo as much as I can just because it makes sense on both sides. Do you have relationships on both sides of the border? Yeah, we do, Governor, and that's a great point. Um, we actually have a strategic partnership with Putnam County uh, and the County Executive Mary Ellen O'Dell. Uh, and really about 50% of our economic activity that goes on in Danbury and the greater Danbury area, including employees that come to Western Connecticut State University, Danbury Hospital, our corporate partners, come from New York State. So these two uh, entities, while separated by a line, there's really no separation between us, and we have to work together. We have stayed in touch. We've been working together, and the decisions that you're making with Governor Cuomo uh, on a basis of, of really looking at this holistically are going to make a difference here in the greater Danbury area. Uh, we have to work closely with New York State, otherwise it's just not going to make any sense the things that we're doing. So that strategic partnership has been invaluable. Well, thank you. And um, Mayor Rilling, I assume you're there. Um, uh, Harry Rilling's been on the front lines there at Norwalk. Norwalk was hit hard. Um, uh, they have a number of big stores there, so they have a fair amount of population that comes in and out of uh, Norwalk all the time, which maybe accelerated some things there. Uh, Harry, how are you doing in Norwalk? Uh, we're doing well, Governor, and thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this. This is so critical that we are having these conversations. You know, Norwalk now has almost 780 positive cases and 36 deaths. And those deaths, you, you hit it spot on. Every one of those deaths cuts to your core because it's a, it's, a, it's a member of your community. You know, we did get hurt early on, and we knew that we needed to get everybody to the table as quickly as we possibly could. You know, we're right in the middle of Darien, Westport, Wilton, and New Canaan. And we have two Walmarts, uh, two shop rights, a shop, uh, two stop and shops, a shop right, a Costco, a Stu Leonard's. Uh, and, and we knew that people were coming into our community. But moreover, we have people on a daily basis that were traveling into New York City, thousands of people then coming home in the evening. So we knew we had to get on top of this immediately. We needed to bring people to the table. So immediately on a Thursday morning, we started having conversations, conference calls with our hospital, our uh, public school system, our health department, uh, community-based health centers, EMS, police, fire, uh, our, our state delegation, our common council, so that we're all talking and constantly figuring out where we are at any given time and what the next step is. So early on, we had to make some very, very difficult decisions, as I know you have as well. And you've been there with us right away from the very beginning, and I truly, truly appreciate that. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you and without the other stakeholders that are so critical to uh, making sure that we get through this. Um, we now have a virtual ELC meeting every Tuesday morning, uh, just going through all the things where we are. Thankfully, our hospital is doing relatively well. They've repurposed a lot of rooms, um, but they knew they had to do this uh, early on because they saw what was happening. Uh, Norwalk, at a point in time, was the epicenter of Fairfield County. Um, we had continued to grow. Uh, but I agree 100% with Mayor Bouton. We have done so much and may move so forward and we know that social or physical distancing is the most effective way and we have to continue that the biggest mistake we can make right now is to go back and be complacent and get a false sense of security that this is over this is not over and i agree that may 20th is a date that needs to be looked at as to what we do going forward so again thank you and um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this Thank you, Harry. And Harry and Mark are both available for questions if anybody has any questions from our frontline mayors. We'll start with NBC Connecticut.
NBC Connecticut. Connecticut Hi, Mirror. Uh, go, go ahead, Matt. Hi, Governor. Matt Austin with NBC Connecticut. Uh, just wondering, in terms of the testing you were talking about and that we were down in sample kits, can you explain what the snag is right now and how we could go about fixing that? Want to start with that? Sure. Hi, uh, Matt. Uh, Josh Jabal. Uh, so there's a global shortage right now in the swabs and the transfer media for a number of the technologies that are used to perform the PCR testing for COVID-19. Um, we and our hospitals and our state lab and uh, all of the drive through testing facilities are in a constant battle every day to procure more supplies and that happens to be the commodity which is in short supply now but we know more is coming. We also um, are working through CDC guidelines on some additional um, alternate approaches to collect samples um, using more commonly available uh, materials and saline solution. Our state lab is actually helping to produce some of those kits. And then another uh, ray of hope on uh, increasing the testing going forward is there's some technologies now that are being um, piloted that could collect samples via saliva samples as well. So that would be a real game changer and that should not be too far uh, down the horizon. And just a quick follow up in terms of increasing the testing. Have experts given you a clearer idea of exactly how many tests we should aim for in the state on a daily basis? Well, that's why we have the um, advisory board that we uh, talked about yesterday. We're going to roll them out formally in the next uh, few days. And those are the type of questions they're going to focus on. How expansive should the testing be? Where do you want to have the antibody testing? Where do you want to have the molecular testing? Uh, but I think it's really imperative that we get going on this soon so we have a better idea in a two, three, four weeks exactly what the infection map looks like here in the state. That tells us what our options are. Connecticut Mirror. Uh, Governor, uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, I guess, a political question. Um, there, you got pushed back on Friday, really for the first time, about your handling of the crisis. And then today, um, I'm seeing uh, some opposition among a couple of Republicans to the idea of Connecticut sort of working that closely with New York in particular. So. Is the presence of mayors uh, Boughton and Rilling um, meant to counter that? No, the presence of, of the mayors is to give us a first line um, example of what's going on. But you're, you're right, you did hear um, Mayor Boughton talk about, and I prompted him, uh, how important it is to work with uh, your, your neighbors. And in his case, the neighbors are another state. You did hear um, Harry Rilling say, look, a lot of people come in and out of Norwalk every day. A lot of them come from neighboring towns. A lot of them come out of New York City, which is one of the reasons um, you know, Norwalk was hit particularly hard and particularly early. Uh, no, I'm trying to send the message and I'm trying to work with our legislative leaders as well as the healthcare professionals. Follow the lead of the experts. Let's hear what they have to say. Tell us when we can safely start getting people back to work and give us a, a, a roadmap on how we get there. It starts with testing. So, yep, I'm hearing a little bit of some folks saying, open it up tomorrow. I'm hearing other people say, lock it down. I think we've got the right balance going forward. I think you see that we are bending the curve and uh, certainly in Fairfield County, I think you're beginning to see that in New Haven. The social distancing is working, but I don't want to, go a false sense of a complacency. It'd be just terrible if we had a second round of this pandemic. But how much effort are you putting into making sure you are in effect bringing people along with your thought process on working with other states as well as uh, your closure order through May 20th? Um, well, certainly I talk to the scientific community all the time and I ask them to uh, speak out and give them, ask them to give us their best advice. And you're going to get some formal advice from uh, the advisory board uh, within a week or so on that. I talk informally with the legislative leaders uh, quite a bit. Paul talks uh, formally with them a, a lot more than quite a bit. Uh, just to make sure that we all know exactly what we're doing. I can tell you that uh, Roland Cook, our uh, Commissioner of Corrections, was on with um, you know, I think most of the legislators uh, yesterday, maybe Democrats and then Republicans, just to give an idea of what we're doing in corrections. So, look, we're doing everything we can to give you an idea of how we're thinking about this, why we're thinking about this. And uh, there's no question it'll get probably a little more political. There's some uh, noise coming out of Washington as well. 
But I think the governors are pretty united in terms of how we thoughtfully get our states back to work. Each state's going to do it at their own pace, but we're comparing notes every day, and I think that's a good thing. And if I could just ask uh, Mayor Bowden, because I can see him on my screen, I can see him smiling at my questions. So <laughs> would, would the mayor care to comment on the extent to which this is starting to get a little political? Well, look, I think that there's time for politics later on. Uh, right now, this is about healing our state, healing our nation, if you will, and, and our communities. And um, there is really no value in sniping at each other. I think the governor has struck a solid path. I, I want to get open, too, but I don't want to have to go to our residents and say, well, you've got to shelter in place for another six weeks because we didn't do it right the first time. This is a tough medicine for us, but we all have to take it. And we've got to wait this thing out. And working uh, strategically with other states is the right thing to do. I noticed that Massachusetts now has been pulled into that orbit as well. And that's important because there's no sense just going across the border and having a different set of rules. So uh, I think we're doing all the right things. I know it's hard and it's frustrating for people, but it's what we have to do. Thank you, gentlemen. Move on to Boceto Media. Hi, Governor. Um, my, I have two questions for you. Uh, my first question is, how will the state make sure that to identify business sectors that will be able to reopen easier with safe distancing standards? And my second question is, what is your opinion on the series of tweets that President Trump, po Trump posted this morning criticizing the new coalition formed by the seven states to reopen the economy? Thanks. Well, I didn't read the president's tweet, so that saves me an answer to that question. Uh, but I will tell you that, look, when we think about opening businesses, I think about, A, those that are critical businesses that we have to keep open. And uh, obviously, that includes uh, you know, food, and that includes pharma, and the things that are open. I want to make sure we can do them as safely as possible going forward. I want to make sure all of our food service workers have a mask. I want to do everything I can to make sure that others coming in and working with them or buying from them have a mask as well, so we have some protection there. I think about our manufacturing. You know, those are big, enormous plant floors with seven, 800 people. Make sure they have the gear they need and the testing they need. And then finally, I think about, um, you know, the retail uh, going forward. Maybe we move towards uh, doing more retail by appointment. Maybe make sure that somebody is tested so that whoever is serving you, you know, is safe. Make sure they have a, um, a mask so that uh, you're protected and, uh, and they're protected as well. And that's a lot of what I'm going to hear from the advisory board over the next couple of weeks. What are those companies? What do they need to open up? And how quickly can we do that? Move along next to the day of New London. Hi, Governor. Two questions. Um, one, do you know how many nursing home workers have tested positive for COVID-19? And the second is that you, um, your office had started to break down um, cases and associated deaths by race, and that data is no longer online. Can you explain why? Want to take that? Yeah. So our informatics team that produces that report every night is um, actively working on the uh, several other requests, including the number of nursing home cases, uh, n number of COVID positive cases by nursing home. And so we've, we're rationalizing the frequency with which we produce some of those. The age and ethnicity data doesn't change much day to day. Those trends are very consistent. We'll continue to publish that data on a regular basis. Um, but uh, that's, that's why there was a, there, that was not in the report uh, yesterday, I think. Let me just say one thing on the nursing homes, because um, I know there's been a lot of concern about let's get the information out, not just broadly, nursing home by nursing home in terms of infections. And uh, I want you to know that while Josh is gathering all that information, we're also making sure that each nursing home has an opportunity to share the information with all the uh, families of the loved ones there uh, now so that uh, nobody is surprised going forward. And that process is going to take another day or so, but we are going to get all that information out to each and every one of you. Move on next to Hearst, Connecticut Media. Oh, sorry for the delay there. Um, hi, Governor Hey, Mayors. Um, I was on a conference call uh, a little while ago with the um, Yale New Haven Health Systems uh, officials, including the chief medical officer, who's talking about how the, the next month is going to be um, 
a plateau into a, um, a decline, and uh, they were stressing the need to uh, keep the social distancing, and they were uh, not saying nice things about uh, the word mutiny during the call. Um, Governor, are you seeing um, the doubling of cases? Is that is that um, distance? Um, growing, it was three to four days a while ago, but it seems like now it's um, take, it's longer. Is that becoming plainer to you? I think it is. I, I think you're seeing that the social distancing worked, but um, it, it's erratic. I, I wish I could show you it's a nice uh, parabolic curve, and it's not. And uh, I, I also know what a dis difference that curve will be if we all go out and um, – and party, and uh, that's why uh, our strict, it's getting tougher and tougher to be disciplined out there. It's getting warmer and warmer out there. People are getting cabin fever. They've been at home for an awful long time. I hear that wherever I go, but when Yale New Haven and the other doctors talk to us, they say we need a little more time to see what um, this curve looks like, and anything I can do to flatten that curve, make sure a loved one will have a bed uh, waiting for them if they need it to keep safe. So do you think the weather has something to do with the, um, the germination of uh, political uh, motivations here and some of the statements out of Washington and within the General Assembly? I'll let somebody else play with that. Anybody want to talk about the weather and politics? How about you, Rilling? Oh, we lost <laughs> Rilling. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I agree with Mayor Bout. This is not a time for politics. You know, we're all in this together. Um, we're part of history. This is something none of us have ever experienced before, you know, and um, we were uh, the epicenter, uh, Fairfield County. Um, we hit the ground running and I think we're leading the charge because we had to do that early on. So politics aside, this is not what this is all about. Uh, there's no uh, Republican or Democratic way to deal with this pandemic. It's uh, talking to each other, moving forward together, putting aside any differences that we have, listening to each other, and like I said, learning from each other. It's critical, and this is the time to do that. Harry, you said that so well. And I also point out, um, you'll hear that from the governors on both sides of the aisle. You'll hear that from Mike DeWine in Ohio. you hear that from Charlie Baker in Massachusetts. Uh, everybody uh, on the front lines and those who the governors are know how important it is to get this crisis behind us as soon as we can, but get it behind us in a way that will be uh, permanent and lasting and safe. Thanks, Governor. Move on to the Waterbury Republican American. Thanks, Max. Uh, I have a question for the two mayors. Um, we've heard a lot about you, what, we've heard a lot of praise from you about the, uh, the state's response. Where did the, where did the state's response fall short? Where were some of the areas that you were frustrated as mayors with uh, how the Lamont administration has handled this outbreak? You want me to start, Mark? Yeah, go ahead, Harry. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to be accused of. Uh, uh, just kowtowing to the governor, but I have to tell you, I deal with my people, my health department, my chief of community services, my chief of staff. Uh, we have reached out to the state of Connecticut frequently, and we've always gotten uh, good information, always good support. Uh, you know, again, I, I applaud the, the, uh, the governor for working with the other six governors, other parts of uh, this particular area. That's how we're going to get through this, if we're all doing the same thing and working together. I can't think of one thing that I felt the state did not respond. We reached out to them and asked them uh, for help, for guidance, uh, for support, uh, for equipment. Whatever we needed, it was always there. You know, it's easy to point fingers, you know, uh, but I always think of uh, Teddy Roosevelt when he said it's not the critic that counts the person in the, arena, in the arena that is out there doing the job and getting it done. Yeah, I, I would just add to that uh, that um, we we struggled a little bit with our uh, shelter in place, our homeless shelter. Uh, we reached out to the state; they were great at, at pulling a bunch of resources together for us to do something that's never been done before, and, and now it's operating very smoothly. Um, so I, I just don't see the state 
falling down at all on this. I think they answered the call, just like local government stepped up every day to do things we've never done before. We figured it out and got it done. Uh, I would say that the next challenge for us will be, what do we do after this? Where, where do we go? I mean, I know Harry's probably dealing with a budget disaster as I am, as I know the state is. Uh, we're all gonna need stabilization and, and trying to be able to deliver core services along with getting the economy restarted and, and fired up again. So there's a lot of work to be done throughout the summer, the fall, and next winter even. And uh, right now though, we know what we have to do in front of us and that's to tackle um, the virus and, and, and make sure that we don't backslide at all in terms of our fight. Um, this is a question for the governor and, and, and Josh. Um, why shouldn't people be concerned that you're rationing information rationing numbers that are important to the public to hear regarding whether it's the uh, rate of infections and deaths among uh, racial and ethnic groups or the number of cases uh, in, in state prisons. Yeah, I don't think there's any truth to the pretext of that question at all. I think you'll find this has been um, incredibly transparent. I'm here every afternoon. I take every single question I can. I bring uh, all of our commissioners here to answer questions, and now we have a mayor's as well. Um, you know, we're getting the information as fast as we can. I, I will tell you, this is an incredibly fast-changing situation, and a lot of the assumptions and numbers we thought we could count on maybe just a month ago are different uh, today. We are all learning as we go. But I got to tell you that I think we got the best team working on it, and uh, I've got to maintain the credibility with the people of the state of Connecticut. And that starts with giving you the truth every day. Well, doesn't well, that also include providing providing the, the, the statistics on like nursing homes? Are, are we waiting uh, just so nursing home operators can react to the to, or prepare reactions to the news of, of the level of uh, infections and deaths in their facilities? Yeah, I mean, Paul, as the governor said earlier, this is a very, very sensitive topic for the people in those nursing homes, and we want to make sure that when we publish that data, we get it perfectly correct and that those uh, families have time to be notified and that there's no confusion about those numbers. So we're, we're taking the time to get that exactly correct before we publish it. But as the governor said, um, we, we have tried at every turn through this crisis to be exceptionally transparent and share every bit of data that we have, and I hear that very consistently from people about the governor's approach to this crisis. We'll move on next to News 8. Maybe Mayor Bowden could start with this one. So you had the first case in Danbury of a worker at a hospital. It knocked out a lot of the frontline medical workers. How fast did it ramp up in the hospitals? How close do we get? We can't see in them. Paint the picture of how close they got to being full. Did they get full? Did you have to send patients elsewhere? How did you deal with it inside the hospital? Well, I think we were, uh, you know, we were prepared. We weren't scared. We were ready for it. Uh, we saw that coming that there would be, because of how contagious this disease is. And, and I think it's fair to say that people even today don't really understand the virus completely and how it spreads. Having said all that, uh, we had set up overflow shelters at the O'Neill Center uh, 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 with over almost 300 beds there ready to go with the National Guard who came in to help us set up that facility. And we were ready. We fortunately haven't had to use it much. But if there is an additional problem later on, if there's another flare up, uh, we certainly have enough capacity now to handle uh, way beyond what Danbury Hospital is rated for. But uh, definitely a scary situation initially. Uh, because there is was so much commingling of that individual with uh, staff as well as uh, other hospitals and, and Mayor Rilling's community and other communities, that person who worked in other buildings. And um, again, just it's so contagious that you just don't know what the impact will be. So did the hospital ever get full? Did, it, did you ever have to kind of shift patients away to other hospitals? I know we saw plenty of capacity, one third, but how hard was it on that hospital? Well, it was, it was hard on staffing. There's no question we had staff members that were working uh, multiple shifts, but in terms of, of space and beds, we didn't get close to being full. All right. And what advice would you give to, say, mayor of New Haven or Hartford about what's coming? Well, you know, I would just say that um, we have systems that are designed and put in place for a reason. Use those systems. Uh, utilize them in any way you can. Re utilize and rely on the people that are there. Look at your strategic partners count on them to do work and ask them to do work. If 
you try to do it all yourself, you're never going to get the job done that you want to get done, and you're not going to serve your residents well. Um, there are times, I think, you know, where you wake up in the middle of the night and, you, and you're scared because you just don't know what this will mean for, for some of the most vulnerable in your community. But at the end of the day, if you leverage all of your resources, you'll find you'll be able to meet the challenges that the virus brings. We're by no means over. It's not finished. we got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think that our system is solid and sound, and you should leverage it and use it. Move on to CT News Junkie. Uh, Governor, last week you were very optimistic that the PPE that the state had ordered would arrive in the state. And earlier today in your comment, uh, you had mentioned that you were standing on the delivery. So what is the status of that? Um, we've got 10 shipments absolutely scheduled for this week, and I'd be delighted if two of them actually arrived. Uh, that's just a fact of the way it is right now with everything's getting rerouted into the gray market, which is why I'm so happy that we'll have the Battelle sanitizer up and operating in uh, seven or eight days, what that means in terms of expanding our capacity. That's why I emphasize some of the smaller businesses that are retooling right now. Uh, look, we are um, doing everything we can to buy the PPE where we need it. It's not just for the health of the frontline workers, it's for the health of our greater community right now. It's part of our back to work strategy. And that's why I can't rush right now until I have enough of the mass and the gear we need so that everybody can get back to work. And so you're, you think that you're gonna get two out of those, those 10 orders? I mean, that's that doesn't seem like enough. I mean, you've got um, correction officers in the Department of Corrections complaining that they don't have the protection enough to make them safe um, to go to work. Yeah. Well, I'll start. Let me hand it over to Josh. But uh, we have gotten, um, you know, tens of thousands of PPE over the last few days. So it's not like everything is dead stop. We're doing a deliveries to all of those frontline responders to our municipalities. We've got an N95 mask. We've gotten the surgical mask. We've gotten a lot of gloves. Is it enough? No. Is it enough right now that I think we can power through for another um, you know, period of time, say a week or so? I think absolutely is the answer to that question. That's no way to run a railroad, though. I've got to build up some capacity. That's why we have significant orders out there, and I'm ready to see them delivered. Yeah, and I, I, just to build on that, Christine, you know, yesterday we received um, about 100,000 uh, pieces of PPE, um, KN95 masks, coveralls, gloves. We distributed over 100,000 pieces of PPE. So we're, we're delivering the, the immediate term needs of our state agencies, of nursing homes when they run into shortages, our hospitals have supply. What the governor is talking about is wanting to build up a, a, war, you know, a war chest and a real stockpile of, a, of PPE that we can then broaden the circle of who we're providing. He's, t he's spoken about wanting to give masks out to people in essential retail businesses and, and others that we want to give those uh, tools to. We want to give our first responders and our hospitals more than the kind of weak supply that they have at any point in time and get into a more comfortable position knowing that we're going to be in this situation for you know weeks to come. Thanks. Move on to the Hartford Current. Thanks, Max. Uh, this question is for the governor or for Josh. Um, can you talk a bit about the virus's movement across the state? Is it moving as quickly across the state as you expected it to? And what county do you think will be the, the next hot spot to take over Fairfield County? Well, I'll start. And all I'm doing is repeating things that um, people smarter than me have told me, like uh, Dr. Carter and um, uh, the new team that we've got in place. I think uh, it hit Fairfield County hard and spread fast and the infection rate was uh, surprising to uh, some of us and we got the uh, social distancing in place. And fortunately we saw it slow. I think you've heard Dr. Carter say a couple of times that we thought at this point um, New Haven County would have been uh, hit harder. And thank God due to the social distancing, we've got things temporarily for now under control in New Haven County. Same is true of Hartford as you keep going further north. Um, Obviously, Bridgeport was a flare-up, so you're going to see flare-ups in different parts of, uh, you know, the state over a period of time. Eastern Connecticut, I've been, um, I've been pleasantly surprised how slow the rate of increase has been there over a period of time, but I think I mentioned to you electric boat and big um, 
factory space there. We've got to keep an eye on it as well. So I think everything is progressing the way we had sort of modeled it, but perhaps the um, growth has been a little slower outside of Fairfield County, and that's a good thing. And I also have a question about antibody testing. Um, how much of a factor do you think that will play as the state moves toward reopening businesses and schools and things like that? And do you expect to do widespread antibody testing or, or would it be more targeted? Want to have fun with that? Yeah, I think this is, that's exactly one of the issues that our um, advisory group is looking at right now. Uh, Dr. Albert Coe and the other uh, scientific experts that have been brought in to help inform that testing strategy um, because there is a lot of new technology coming online um, and there is a lot of strategy and biostatistics around you know where do you want to start and under what conditions but we're looking forward to you know receiving their recommendations as the governor said uh, and getting started on that in the coming uh, week thank you move on next to news 12. Hi, Governor. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, school bus drivers real quick. Two, we uh, two weeks ago, you issued an executive order uh, directing school districts to keep paying uh, bus drivers and the private companies they work for. Uh, but we're hearing instances in Stanford and Bridgeport where the bus drivers are still waiting to get paid. Uh, in some cases, the, the school districts are, are not engaging. In other cases, the district and the private company uh, seem to be pointing fingers at each other about, you know, who's willing to come to the negotiating table to sort of, you know, rework their, their payment agreement. Um, I, what, what would you say to the bus drivers? What are you guys doing to make sure that they get paid promptly and aren't waiting for the rest of the school year for something to happen? Uh, John, I'm going to hand that off to Paul and the mayor since uh, they, they have more direct responsibility there. But what we've tried to do is when it comes to our state employees, when it comes to the not-for-profits, when it comes to our municipalities, is to hold everybody harmless and keep making those payments. Whether you're in work or not in work right now, everybody's telecommuting or doing something for the state. So I've tried to do that, and that's just been the same policy the DECD and the federal government has had for our small businesses. Keep those paychecks going. Keep people um, uh, intact so that on the backside of this crisis, uh, there'll be a job there, there'll be a business there going forward. But do any of you want to speak specifically yeah. to the school buses? Yeah, hi, uh, Paul Mounds here. Uh, we will be putting out um, additional guidance as part of a FAQ document as it deals with that particular uh, executive order that the governor issued. As the governor stated, our main message and main goal is to make sure that those frontline workers in the educational field are continuing to get paid. As the state is continually to provide educational funding to the Board of Education, we thought it would be extremely important that those fundings that are supposed to go to those workers continue to go to those workers. So we will have an additional FAQ document that will be posted uh, tomorrow on this very issue. Move on next to Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, Governor, I want to go back to unemployment. We're still hearing from many who are wanting to know when they're going to get their checks, and you gave that answer. It's going to be coming in a matter of days. But does this apply to everyone who is not self-employed? Does this indicate that the backlogs that we've seen at the Department of Labor are now days rather than the five, six weeks previously? Yeah, I think that is right. Um, uh, we have... Uh, processed, and I think most of the checks that are direct deposit have gone out to, I think, a majority of the people who are in that backlog. I think that's what I heard this morning. I, I think the fix is working right now for everybody except for those self-employed workers. Let's say it's another week to get those out the door, but I think we've uh, caught up, and uh, really my hat's off to the folks over at DOL. They've been working their heart out, and I know how um, frustrating it was. You need that check. It was supposed to be there. You've probably gotten some busy signals on some phone calls, but there is incredible progress on this in the last week. And that federal money, that extra $600 on top of uh, the, the state uh, claims, is that going to be um, in these next checks as well? Want to speak to that? Yeah, that, that's a, a, there's a system uh, coding change that needs to be made to be able to provide that additional $600 payment. Um, we're hopefully getting very close to being able to uh, test and, and execute on that system change, and then those funds will be forthcoming in the not-too-distant future as well. The, the funding is all available. It's just dependent on getting the system enabled to provide that. 
Move along next to Fox 61. Hi, Governor. In New Haven today, we shot video of state workers and contractors appearing to prepare a testing site at Gateway Community College. Could you confirm if that's going to be one of those CVS testing sites you mentioned last week? Um, you said Stanford and New Haven. If not, any updates on those two CVS testing sites? Am I allowed to confirm that? I'll speak to this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, we will be able to have more information to provide uh, later this week as it deals with uh, a potential testing site uh, in New Haven. Uh, to go along with what the governor has talked about last week, uh, we have been in very, very close conversations and collaborations with uh, CVS, uh, but we will have more information on particular testing sites in the New Haven, uh, in the city of New Haven uh, later this week. So is there any update in terms, is there any information you guys could share about Gateway Community College in New Haven specifically in terms of that being a testing site? We'll be able to have more information on that, uh, any particular testing site of that sort later this week. Thank you. WTIC 1080 News. Good afternoon. New York City, unfortunately, went over 10,000 dead this afternoon, revised numbers. As you know, the city's had overwhelming, overwhelmed hospitals. Your hospital capacity has been going quite well by your judgment as of yesterday. You see down the line, accepting some cases from other locations, if the, your hospital capacity situation remains relatively open. Well, I'll tell you what we have been doing so far is uh, <coughs> Hartford Hospital has actually provided a helicopter to allow some of the folks from crowded facilities in uh, New York City to get up to Albany and Buffalo and other locations like that. There's been some cross traffic between hospitals. We certainly have been in close communication there. So if you continue to be relatively wide open, would you, would you take more potentially or is that, or is that a risk of spreading uh, the virus into the state more? Um, I'm, I'm hesitant because uh, our hospitals right now are very close to capacity, especially those that are closest to New York. Associated Press. Yes, uh, Governor, can you clarify a little bit more about what you want to see happen on May 20th? Is this a date where you hope certain things will open or is it a date where you hope to announce another date where things might open? What exactly specifically are you hoping for by May 20th? Want to start with that? Sure. I, I would say overall, <coughs> with all of our executive orders and all of the social distancing measures the governor has put forth as part of the executive orders under the emergency powers, we review them on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that they're still in line with what the public information, public health information that we have, as well as making sure that it's in coordination with what is really going on on the ground. Uh, so the May 20th date uh, that has been put forth as part of uh, the social distancing measures as well as closures is a date that we're going to be, as we get closer to it, we're going to have continued reviews uh, going up to that date. Uh, but we're using that date and backing out from it. We're backing out from that date, like Paul said. We're going to have a lot of testing done by then. We're going to know what our PPE supply is, the stockpile, like Josh said. And that will give us the information we need to know how fast we can get people back to work. At the same time, I'll be looking at other states and see how, what their timing is in terms of, uh, you know, key businesses, uh, restaurants, bars, and the such, since there's some things that require a lot of social interaction where it does make sense to work on a collaborative basis. And secondly, in the prison system, can you discuss what's being done there other than Northern? Are there other prisons or wings of prisons that are being prepared uh, like the nursing homes are as COVID-19 only and, and as uh, this capacity at, at Northern starts to fill up, what, what is being done in the prisons? The one thing, um, I'll be happy to answer that question. One thing that we can announce uh, is that there has been 45 uh, DOC inmates that have been reintroduced into the population that have, who were once in the COVID only units uh, and back into general uh, population, as well as four staff members who were out uh, due to the COVID uh, illness and back to work. Uh, DOC is as on a, they have posted their plans that you'll see on their website, on their COVID uh, specific website, uh, and we are, they continuously 
uh, are working with uh, their partners as well as uh, having conversations with their partners in, in, in other states as, uh, in terms of the continual best practices, but they are working under their uh, protocols uh, as it deals with everything dealing with this issue. And finally, WSHU Radio. Okay, um, Governor, good afternoon. And basically, I'd like to follow up on the, on the prison situation. We had our first death yesterday, and now the ACLU has uh, taken the state to court asking that incarcerated people be released. Uh, are, you, are you thinking of releasing any more people than, than you've, you've, you've released so far? Uh, and how is that working? Why don't you start and I'll finish yeah, there. Thanks, Governor. Uh, as you saw in the, in the previous month, um, there has been uh, releases that have occurred uh, through the DLC system. Has, as the governor previously mentioned, is there a mass release or a release of all uh, strategy? No. What there is is an overall strategy that has been previously put in place with the procedures that DLC has had under their purview. Uh, Overall, uh, Rollin Cook and his team, this is an issue that they work on 24-7. And as the governor mentioned earlier, they have done particular outreach. They have spoke to legislative uh, leaders. They have talk to, talked to legislative caucuses. Uh, while we cannot speak particularly as it deals with the terms of the lawsuit, uh, as the governor showed in previous presentations with Rollin Cook, that there is continuous work that has been going on and will continue to go on as it ensures the overall safety of those within our correction system. Yeah, we care deeply about the health of each and every one of the folks in the correctional facilities, similar to a little bit in terms of other compressed areas like nursing homes and even homeless shelters. Uh, what Roland and his team are doing there, as I've tried to describe before, is do everything we can to um, make sure that there are fewer people going in, if there's any way they can stay out in a safe environment, and uh, look at all the folks who are the most vulnerable within the um, facility and see if we can find a safe place for them outside of the facility or elsewhere within the uh, correctional facility where they can be safe and where we can make sure they have the medical needs they do. And also, they're doing a risk assessment, so a lot of folks are also being let out who are there for, um, who are considered a much lower risk in terms of uh, potential violence and the such. So it's based upon health and it's based upon risk. Um, and we're taking this very seriously. The, the prison population is the lowest it's been in um, over a generation right now. And that does expand a, a fair amount of capacity, allows um, folks who are incarcerated there to have more self-quarantine and uh, be in a safer environment, often a safer environment than they may find outside of the correctional facility. I'd like to just tell you one nice story that I uh, had today that may make you think that it's Lego. Lego is uh, the American base is in Enfield, Connecticut, and uh, Skip Kodak uh, gave me a call, and 100% of Lego in Connecticut is telecommuting now. And I just said, well, how you doing, and how's business? And the telecommuting is working. The infection rate is extraordinarily low. People are taking uh, their social distancing very seriously there. But I thought it was amusing. He said, um, believe it or not, with everybody at home and families at home and more homeschooling, um, this is a pretty busy time for Lego and all the incredibly complicated um, construction uh, games that they were able to put together. So he said, not only are puzzles and maps selling, so is Lego selling. And in particular, some of the most exotic uh, Lego designs, the, um, you know, the Millennium Fa uh, Falcon and the Death Star, things that get mom and dad involved as well as the kids. And uh, by the way, a lot of that is uh, sold to the big stores. A lot of it's sold online via um, over the internet and those internet sales. And we do have a sales tax on that, sorry to say, but it's really keeping our um, sales tax revenues up because otherwise they'd be collapsing. But I didn't want to end on that. I wanted to end on the fact that um, Lego took a look at uh, Bridgeport and saw the spiking going there. And kids are going to be probably spending at least another month uh, at home. And uh, they just announced uh, a great, um, donation of uh, about 1600 to every single first grader in um, Bridgeport, a new environmental Lego um, game 
which I think is a learning process and a, uh, and a fun thing for these kids to do. And every day I'm inspired by a little story like that that reminds people, um, stay serious about the social distance, but also remember your friends. Remember your friends in a community that may not be quite on the mend as fast as your community. And we do that, stick together. Remember a senior who may be at home, drop off a meal for them as well. Knock and drop, don't have to go visit. And we're gonna get through this together. Thank you, everybody.